The Harmonic Convergence, Chapter 9, Timelines Converging. The early morning sun peeped over the horizon, birthing a new day with a warm golden glow. As the sun filtered across the great harbour, lighting up the ancient city of Alexandria and beyond, the lighthouse on Pharos Island stood like a sentinel overseeing the harbour entrance. It was breathtaking to behold. <laughs> We prepared refreshments and gathered together on the deck to enjoy our bountiful array of fruits, breads and fragrant teas. Cinderella tore a piece of bread into a bite-sized chunk and dunked it into her apple tea. The lighthouse is so unusual, she commented looking out across the harbour towards Pharos Island. I have been struck by the unique architecture ever since we arrived here. Ah yes, the lighthouse, I said. As you can see, it is square at the lower levels, it has an octagonal middle level and it is cylindrical at the top. It is a tribute to sacred geometry. Imra also turned his attention towards the lighthouse. The lighthouse stands at an impressive height of around 350 feet and is completely built of stone. It reminds me of a story about Arsinoe, the sister of Cleopatra, I said, wiping a tear from my cheek. Naishara nodded slowly. I know that story well, she said. We are able to sense it deeply as we were all involved. What happened, Samira? asked Shama Ra, her eyes wide with the expectation of another storytelling adventure. Well, I began. The historians of 21st century Earth claim that Arsinoe and her sister Cleopatra came from the royal lines of Egypt. However, they actually came from Ireland. Do you mean that they were Celtic Druids also? exclaimed Cinderella. Yes, I said. As we have mentioned, before the birth of the fabled Christ, the Roman forces under Julius Caesar almost took the entire eastern Mediterranean coastal area. Only Egypt remained as a sovereign country and negotiations were underway for Egypt's surrender. When the king Ptolemy XII died, continued Maxim, his eldest son Ptolemy XIII was only 11 years of age. The king, therefore, left equal parts of his kingdom to his eldest son and his eldest daughter, Cleopatra. Cleopatra was 18 years of age. I remember that Ptolemy XIII, interjected Dulkara, the 11-year-old boy and his 16-year-old sister, Arsinoe, were in favour of non-cooperation with the Romans. This was also the sentiments of the Egyptian people. Cleopatra, however, was in favour of full cooperation with Rome. And being the older sibling, said Sarah, she had more power when it came to making decisions. 
The Romans had a base on the outskirts of Alexandria, said Dulcara. They were under the command of Julius Caesar, and being in large numbers, they were preparing for a major invasion. A fight broke out between Cleopatra and Ptolemy XIII, interjected Maxim. This fight ended where Arsinoe and Ptolemy XIII expelled Cleopatra and her guards from Egypt to the Lower Nile. Asteria stood up, her arm raised as though she was wielding a sword. I will be Arsinoe, and you can be Cleopatra, she exclaimed to Minerva. Minerva playfully put her arm around Asteria's shoulders. I think that you should be Ptolemy the Thirteenth, and I will be Arsinoe. <laughs> I am not a boy, laughed Asteria. Ankai flashed me a glance. Sit down and listen to the story, she said softly. After Cleopatra was expelled, I continued, Ptolemy XIII and Arsinoe invited Julius Caesar to stay at the royal palace and begin negotiations. However, Cleopatra entered Alexandria at night and wrapping herself in a blanket, she infiltrated the royal palace. She messed up her hair, tore her clothes, and crying, she pleaded to Julius Caesar. She claimed that she had been deprived of her birthright as Queen of Egypt, and she would live in exile for all of eternity, unless Julius Caesar could help her. Oh, so Cleopatra used her youth and beauty to beguile Julius Caesar, said Asteria. And did she spend the entire night with him? I smiled at Asteria. I can see that you have heard similar stories. Yes, that is correct. Julius Caesar was 52 years old, Cleopatra was 22 years old, and she could easily influence Caesar with her youthful guile. Of course, this could be seen as an act of high treason, said Imra. The next morning, I continued, Ptolemy XIII found the two together, and throwing off his crown, he screamed that Cleopatra had betrayed him and stabbed all of Egypt in the back. Of course, uh, Ptolemy the Thirteenth summoned his army to fight Julius Caesar, added Altar, and soon a great and bloody battle began. Caesar's forces stormed the palace and took Arsinoe and Ptolemy the Thirteenth hostage. Oh, <gasps> my goodness! exclaimed Minerva, and then what happened? In the port, continued Ankai, the Roman soldiers set fire to the Egyptian ships and burned Alexandria. They burned Alexandria? exclaimed Cinderella. Oh, is this when they took all of the documents from the Alexandria Library? Yes, said Maxim. Of course, this is on another timeline. Uh, the Egyptian soldiers put down their arms in an attempt to save the city of Alexandria, continued Altar. And the Roman forces took control of the lighthouse on the island of Pharos. Um, the island was one of the wonders of the ancient world and an emblem for the royal family. 
Well, said Maxim, the Roman forces also wanted to control the maritime traffic that entered and left the port. Unfortunately, said Imra, the young Ptolemy XIII tried to escape from the Romans, but as he swam from Pharos Island, where he had been hiding, he drowned. Oh my! exclaimed Minerva. So Cleopatra had succeeded in defeating her first rival without even lifting a finger. Arsinoe also jumped into the Nile and managed to swim away from the Roman soldiers, I continued. She then contacted the Egyptian generals who were fighting to save Alexandria from the flames and that night the generals proclaimed Arsinoe as their queen. It was Arsinoe who would lead them against their fight with Rome. Our position was looking positive at this stage, said Naishara. A counter-attack was organised and Caesar's soldiers on Pharos Island were defeated. Julius Caesar himself had to swim from the island to one of his boats to save his own life. Ah, exclaimed Minerva, so the great Julius Caesar had been defeated by Arsinoe, who was only a 16-year-old girl. It certainly did appear that way, said Maxim. However, Julius Caesar brought reinforcements, elite legions from Syria, and after attacking the royal palace in Alexandria, they proclaimed Cleopatra as the undisputed queen. In the tradition of Egypt, Cleopatra was to marry her younger brother, Ptolemy XIV, who was a very young boy. Well, what happened to Arsinoe? asked Minerva, who was obviously concerned for her safety. Arsinoe was held in a dungeon in the royal palace, said Irama, and Julius Caesar instructed her to be taken to Rome. I understand that Cleopatra, said Ariana, claimed that she was the reincarnation of Ishtar, a goddess in Egyptian mythology, and used this to gain the respect of the Egyptian people. At the same time, Arsinoe also claimed to be the reincarnation of Ishtar, and this caused great confusion and scepticism. As it was Cleopatra who was queen, however, they began to see her as Ishtar. While Arsinoe was in captivity, said Ankai, loyal servants helped her to escape from the dungeon. She crossed the Nile in a rowboat, dressed as a peasant, and was transported to Palestine with a caravan of people who resisted the Romans. I remember, said Irama, that in the small town of Magdala, on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, Arsinoe began giving advice to Palestinian and Jewish leaders and provided them with guerrilla and asymmetric combat ideas to fight the Romans. Asymmetric combat? What is that? inquired Asteria. It is similar to the 21st century Navy SEALs, or the SAS Specialist Troops, said Dorkara, where a small number of people can make a tactical surprise attack and then quickly withdraw. The enemy never really see their adversary, and this can demoralize them. At the same time, said Ariana, Arsinoe began to give teachings about consciousness and how the universe works. Over time, she gained popularity within the area. 
In those times, said Sarah, as women were not permitted to be heard in front of the high classes en masse, she asked a close friend to deliver the information. His name was Azazel, and she gave him her teachings to share as his. I nodded in agreement. Actually, this arrangement lasted for two years, I said. Although Arsino and Azazel had to regularly dodge the Roman legions. Eventually, however, someone told the Romans that Arsino was hiding in Galilee and she was found and arrested. Oh no, said Shamara. Not again. Fortunately, said Ankai, Arsino was able to escape by sea from a port that is now known as Haifa, as she wanted to return to England, Ireland and Scotland. The Druids at that time were also resisting the Romans and Arsino knew that she would be safe there. Azazel, however, interjected Dulkara, who was planning to accompany Arsino to Ireland, was arrested and accused of mass instigation. As a result, he was hung from a tree. Really? Oh, that is so sad, said Asteria. Arsino continued on her journey until she reached Malta, said Imra. However, while docking for supplies, the Romans encircled the Strait of Gibraltar and intercepted her journey. Yes, she had no choice but to sail to the southern coast of France, I said, and with the help of the Gauls and the French, who were also resisting Rome, she intended to cross France by land to the English Channel. There, she would embark on another ship and sail to Ireland and Scotland. She did reach the coast of France, just south of Montpellier, said Maxim. However, in the Carcassonne area, she was intercepted and followed by a Roman patrol. Arsenault and her group of supporters were forced to move south and seek refuge in the Cathar Mountains. Asno was so strong. What an amazing woman, said Cinderella with admiration. Yes, she was, said Naishara. She was cherished by each and every one of us. After a year, remembered Irama fondly, Asano felt that it was safe to continue her journey. This was a mistake. When she reached Montsegur Castle, she was stopped by the Roman cavalry. Arsino was arrested, chained, and in the following days, taken in a caged cart to the city of Rome, where Julius Caesar received her as a war trophy. My goodness, exclaimed Shah Mara. This man is certainly determined to seek his revenge. Julius Caesar condemned Arsinoe to be devoured by beasts in the Colosseum, I said. They built a replica of the lighthouse in Alexandria, which was an emblem of the royal family of Egypt, and intended to burn it down while Arsinoe was being eaten alive. Julius Caesar publicly announced this great event and boasted about how he had captured the Egyptian princess queen who had dared to insult him and Rome. On the day of the event, said Ariana, the Colosseum was filled with crowds of people who were cheering and making an enormous noise. First, they dressed Arsino in the clothes of an Egyptian queen, then they unchained her stripped her naked and put her into a large cage on an ornate horse-drawn carriage. Ah, 
I don't think I can listen to any more cringed Minerva. I know how you feel, I said. I could feel tears pricking the backs of my eyes as I recalled Arsinoe's experience with the Romans. I looked around at everyone on the deck, searching their expressions, and witnessed that there were tears in all of our eyes. Well, I want to know what happened next, encouraged Asteria. Irama looked at Asteria. The trumpet sounded as a horse-drawn carriage circled the replica of the lighthouse of Alexandria, she said solemnly. Julius Caesar wanted everyone to see the Egyptian queen being humiliated. At some point, she would be released from the cage and the audience would be entertained watching her run away, desperate to escape from the beasts. This is outrageous, said Shama Ra in disgust. The audience was, however, against the sacrifice of the Egyptian queen, said Naishara, and they all booed Julius Caesar and asked him to spare her life. In the crowd, said Maxim, there was a man of political position called Claudius Vespus, and he asked Caesar if he could buy Arsinoe as a personal slave. He offered Caesar a bag of gold as payment. However, Caesar laughed at the idea of being paid and told Vespus that he could have the woman. The carriage and the cage with Arsinoe inside exited the arena of the Colosseum and Arsinoe was taken to the private villa of Claudius Vespus. Well, this doesn't feel like a victory for Arsinoe, said Cinderella dubiously. You are correct, I said. At the villa, Claudius Vespus offered Arsinoe the comforts of his home. However, he wanted to use her as a sex slave. When Arsinoe refused to make herself available to him, Claudius Vespus ordered that she be handed over to the guards. The guards raped her, and then, at dawn, they whipped her back until she bled. Well, uh, under Caesar's decree, uh, said Altar, through Claudius Vespus, Arsinoe was ordered to go into exile to Ephesus City in the provinces uh, where she was forced to live under observation by the priests in the temple. Please, tell me that she was safe, pleaded Shamara. After two or three months, explained Altar, Cleopatra discovered that Arsinoe was still alive and arranged for her sister's death. One evening, eight Roman soldiers entered the temple, dragged Arsinoe out of her bed by her hair, and holding her down, they killed her with their swords. Shama Ra put her hands to her head and sobbed. Oh no, said Minerva, as she lay curled up on the kilim cushions. I could see that there were tears running down her temples also, and the rise and fall of her chest revealed that she was sobbing. Asteria was also visibly shaken and her hands over her face, we could see that the story had moved her deeply. Arsinoe was buried in a small tomb, I continued, shaped like the lighthouse at Alexandria. It was an eight-sided octagon tomb. 
We had all done our best to help Arsino reach us, said Naishara. However, in the end, we were unable to bring her to safety. The Egyptians adopted Cleopatra as a symbol and an icon, added Ariana, as Ishtar, the one that the Dark Ones worship. The Dark Ones had wanted Egypt for a long time, from the time of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, and now Cleopatra had fulfilled their wish. The Dark Ones say that Cleopatra is the good one, said Sarah, because they turn everything around to create division, and also because she served them. After all, she gave them Egypt. And Arsinoe is the bad one, or the black Ishtar, said Ankai, because she fought against them. It is the winner who writes the stories, said Dorkara, always writing to glorify themselves, and that is why it is called his story. I heard that Arsino was actually Mary Magdalene, said Cinderella. Yes, that is correct, said Ankai. The name Mary is equivalent to the zodiac sign Virgo, as this is the mother of the sun in the story of the Saviour. This is why Mary was a virgin. She was the sign of Virgo, the virgin. Ishtar is also another name for Mary. It is also said that Mary Magdalene was the wife of Jesus, I added. However, this is adapted from the story of Arsinoe providing information to Azazel so that he could share it with the people. Although it would be difficult to prove, it is assumed that some of these teachings are reflected in the original teachings of Jesus. Clearly, began Altar, the story of Arsino and Azazel was used in the Jesus story by Josephus and his scribes with the intention to smear their reputation. They painted Arsino as a prostitute because she was one of the leaders of the resistance in the Palestinian area. Arsinoe was the only woman to defeat Julius Caesar militarily, and the Dark Ones used these defamations to muddy people's understanding. These events do not entirely coincide with the scriptures, said Ariana. However, Josephus and his scribes modified all the dates to artificially coincide with their agenda. As we have discussed, the story of Jesus is nothing more than an astrological compilation mixed with many different forms of paganism and modified anecdotes from the military campaigns of General Titus. And what about the so-called secret gospels? began Cinderella. For example, Mary Magdalene, Judas and others. Um, who wrote them, and why? They are all considered to have been included in the scriptures. Uh, since Josephus and his scribes under Vespasian collected and altered everything, said Altar, there are no writings that can be relied upon to tell the truth. Oh! I wish I could have met Arsinoe. She is my heroine, said Shama Ra adoringly. Well, actually, once we leave Pharos Island, announced Maxim, we are going to retrace the journey of Arsinoe as she travelled through Europe. We are going to journey to a seaport called Set, just south of Montpellier. To get there, we will enter a huge, protected, inland lagoon, accessible from the Mediterranean Sea. The French call the lagoon Etang de Dao. From there, Arsinoe journeyed through France 
to where she stayed for two years before being captured. We all looked at each other and with joyful exclamations considered our next journey. <laughs> However, continued Maxim, at set we will provision the boat and then proceed along the French coastline. We will head for the Pyrenees and Spanish border and then make our way overland to where Arsenault spent a year or so in exile. Oh, how exciting! Asteria joyfully exclaimed. When do we leave? I suggest that we prepare ourselves for the journey to Atang de Dao and set sail today, said Maxim excitedly. With renewed excitement, we up anchored, hoisted the mainsail, adjusted the sheet ropes, and comfortably set sail in a westerly direction. After an hour or so, we felt a light breeze coming from the east. As the sails filled, we felt Orca 2 lift slightly, and she picked up two knots of speed. As Orca 2 gathered pace, we felt the excitement of the momentum and headed forward into another adventure. I am wondering, mused Cinderella, has there ever been a time when humanity had the opportunity to ascend together? I mean, out of the third density matrix. Well, that is an excellent question, said Irama. Yes, there is a converging of all timelines, and that date is the 21st of December, 2012. Really? 2012? How exciting, said Minerva. And what is so special about that date? Why is that time so significant? Well, began Maxim, to answer that question, first let us describe how timelines work. There are infinite timelines that we can be on. We can move forward as one humanity. However, we can also all be on different individual timelines. Although we can be on different timelines, they can be similar with a desired communal outcome. For example, the new fifth density Earth. Um, there are thousands of timelines and thousands of Earths, said Altar, and on the lowest frequency timeline, the Dark Ones have removed half of the population and are in complete control. While on another higher frequency timeline, said Sarah, people have successfully raised their frequency and ascended. The highest frequency timeline is where Earth and all of humanity have ascended, said Ankai. It is important to see everyone on the best timeline that can be imagined. So how do we actually get onto that timeline where we can all ascend? inquired Asteria. Imagine, said Maxim, that the only thing in the universe that is real is an individual's consciousness in the now moment. Well, the only place that is real is the now moment because it is outside of temporal or time expressions, interrupted Altar. When an individual is in fear, I added, or if they have attachments to anything, they are living in the past or the future. The past and the future are two places that aren't real. In fact, an individual's fear and attachments from the past creates their future. And this works in the opposite direction too, said Ariana. If they are in fear, 
in a future timeline, that future timeline can affect their now or their past. Oh my gosh, said Minerva, her hands to her head. My head is going dizzy. Focus, Minerva, said Asteria playfully, and they both <laughs> laughed. <laughs> If an individual <laughs> is in the past or the future, said Imra, the only place that they are not is in the now moment. If there is something that an individual could not deal with in the past, said Irama, and they project this into the future, this keeps them in linear time. This is called living unconsciously, and in this case, they are unaware of who they actually are beyond the self-created or co-created third density experience. Is it then possible to get stuck in a loop? inquired Shama Ra. A loop? asked Cinderella. What do you mean, a loop? A loop, said Sara is the trap of reincarnation. When the biological body dies, the consciousness continues, so all that you have left behind is the body. Whatever you have learned, or whatever you have not resolved yet, you bring back into the next life. You can replay the same scenario with the same people over and over again, hundreds or maybe thousands of times. Each time you are in a negative loop, you strengthen those negative experiences. And can that work in the positive experiences also? inquired Shama Ra. I am glad that you asked that question, said Sara. Yes. We have had so many happy incarnations as well. Our lifetimes of happiness have been repeated over and over again with the same people also, although playing different roles, and that is why we are all here today. Does that mean that when you are in a positive loop, asked Cinderella, you intensify those experiences with the accumulation of each positive experience. Yes, said Sara, and isn't that beautiful? All timelines, however, said Maxim, whether they are a loop or not, are deterministic. So the only way to get out of a loop or to change a particular outcome is to timeline jump onto a different frequency timeline. To do that, we need to be a frequency match for the timeline that we want to jump onto. However, I said, the timeline that we want to jump onto will also be deterministic. So, said Asteria, inclining her head. That means that free will is an illusion. That is correct, agreed Maxim. If you use your free will to change a deterministic timeline, all that you are doing is creating a loop. It is not until you raise your frequency that you can change your timeline. So, a loop will always return you to the original timeline, said Shama Ra, because all timelines are deterministic. A loop is a revolving door where you return to the same people and the same situations until you choose to raise your frequency. That is correct, smiled Maxim. So, what do we do to create a new timeline from the now? asked Minerva. Well, continued Maxim, every timeline is woven into every other timeline, 
So when we change our frequency, we can then jump onto a timeline that has the same frequency. That timeline will also be deterministic, however, it will provide a different outcome. While there is no free will as such, what you do have is the freedom to jump timelines. There are infinite timelines and infinite experiences. Our free will is the possibility to choose which timeline we want to experience. And the way to raise our frequency, said Sarah, is to feel and integrate the painful feelings that live in our shadow selves, to let go of the beliefs that we are attached to, and to understand higher concepts of how the universe works. When we understand how the universe works, interjected Altar, we are able to create beyond our wildest dreams. When we raise our frequency, new and unknown possibilities become available to us. That is so exciting, exclaimed Asteria. So, as all timelines are happening now, said Maxim, as you raise your frequency, you can experience more and more positive timelines, all at the same time. The more you raise your frequency, and the more positive timelines that you experience, you come to realize that all timelines are prime creator, experiencing itself through those timelines, in the present moment, or the now. When you raise your frequency, I conferred, instead of having your own individual experience, you experience all that is simultaneously. You are experiencing Prime Creator. Remember, though, that Prime Creator is experiencing itself through every individuated spark or portal, and in this way, we are Prime Creator itself. When you change your thoughts, said Ankai, and you change your frequency, that changes your DNA, and this occurs in both negative and positive frequencies, depending upon your free will choices. In other words, your thoughts create your reality, and these thoughts map your DNA. All thoughts create. Maxim, his eyes alight with the excitement of our conversation, was eager to offer more information. Now, imagine that you, right now, are in your now moment, he said, and as each second unfolds, you are moving through time. Oh, and time, added Asteria, is only relevant in the material world, right? And, interjected Minerva, time is also experienced at a rate that is dependent on the frequency of the individual. Yes, said Maxim, and each new now moment is a ball of energy, so you are a ball of energy moving on a timeline from one now moment to the next now moment. Now, imagine that behind you there are ten timelines coming in from the left to the right, and each one of these is a timeline of you. They are different versions of you, or incarnations of you, all feeding into you in this now moment. Um, actually, interjected Altar, there are timelines feeding into you from every direction, uh, above you, below you, and all around you, if you like. These many timelines create a sphere of timelines that surround you. Naishara nodded in agreement. You can look along any of those timelines and see versions or variations of you, 
doing something on each timeline, she said. They are not identical. However, they will all be having a similar experience as you in this life, but with different outcomes. Imagine that every relationship that you have had is being experienced right now on your other respective timelines, said Dulkara. Whether you have parted with the person or not, there is a timeline where you are still together. Now imagine that your higher self is experiencing all of those relationships to see what he or she can learn from them. They are not over, they all exist, and they are intertwined with each other. All of these timelines impact each other because all of them are you, said Ankai. <laughs> Do you think that your soul only wanted to experience one outcome in this lifetime? laughed Irama. The common denominator is you now, said Ariana, because your attention is where you are now. Every second of every day, said Sarah with a huge smile on her face, an individual is modulating their frequency and constantly navigating the possibilities of timelines. They choose their timeline depending upon the frequency that they are holding and vibrating at, so all of those choices are made moment by moment. Um, again, all thoughts create, said Ulta. Here is the exciting bit, exclaimed Maxim. You, right now, can make a huge change a quantum leap in consciousness, and that change travels along all of those timelines and changes them all. You can bring all of your other timelines into your now reality timeline by being present in the now moment. When a human being is aligned with love, compassion, non-judgment and empathy, said Ankai, they can wake up and animate all of their other higher vibrational timelines and together they can create a powerful collective animated timeline. When humans are aligned with this powerful higher vibrational and awake timeline, said Naishara, their other lower vibrational timelines can align with it too because you are no longer animating them. Oh, I love this! exclaimed Shama Ra. Another exciting possibility, interjected Sara, is that right now you can meditate, talk to yourself in another timeline, and then come back. You can access your other selves on other timelines learn from them and bring that knowledge into your now timeline. Remember though, said Altar, you can still jump onto those other lower vibrational timelines at any time because they still exist, but you are not animating them. So wait, interjected Cinderella, even although we have made a quantum leap and jumped onto a positive timeline, we can still jump onto those other timelines. Yes, well, there may still be an echo from a previous timeline, continued Maxim. An echo could be considered as unfinished business in other lives on other timelines. In other words, all of the unfinished business on all of those other lower frequency timelines can be drawn into your now experience. And in the same way, the higher frequency experiences on other timelines can also be drawn into your now experience. This is called integration. 
The important point here, said Ankai, is that when the consciousness integrates these lower frequency timelines, a weak signal is left there or an element of the experience of the consciousness that remains on that timeline, and that is called an echo. Um, let me get this right, said Shama Ra. There are multiple timelines, all feeding into the now consciousness. Um, some are echoes of timelines, as well as timelines that are off planet or from other realities and realms, and they are all feeding into an individual's consciousness in the now moment also. Excellent, said Naishara, clapping her hands. It can be seen as complex. However, it is simply all about frequencies. Unfortunately, said Sarah, many new ages are waiting for a solar flash, hoping that Earth will go automatically into fifth density, thus eliminating or reducing the necessity of looking inwards and doing their inner work. Instead, they are outward looking, hoping that the necessary changes come from outside of themselves. The global ascension depends upon the elevation of the individual's consciousness of the people on Earth. However, we can ascend at any time, can't we? asked Minerva. Yes, I said. However, to return to the original question, is there a time when humanity can ascend together? Yes, there is. On the 21st of December, 2012, all timelines converge onto this temporal point or date and time. This convergence allows or makes possible all probabilities all probabilities can move forward from this temporal point, especially those that move into the higher realms. And from here, humanity's ascension is possible. The higher realms? How does that work? asked Asteria. All of the timelines of all humans on Earth converge on the 21st of December 2012 interjected Irama, and from that one point, a new and higher timeline moves forward and out of it. Every individual at that time has the choice whether or not they want to be on that higher timeline. So all of our timelines merge into one timeline, said Cinderella, and from that one timeline, humanity can create a brand new timeline. Yes, said Irama. And are you also saying, continued Cinderella, that there is the possibility that Earth can be reset on that date into a new fifth density Earth? Absolutely! And isn't that exciting, said Ariana. And don't forget, cautioned Dulkara, the Dark Ones can also look along timelines and see that they all converge into one point on that date. So the Dark Ones know that all of the timelines, everything that they have done in the past, and everything that they want to continue in the future, also all converge in 2012. That is why, since 2012, in Earth's future, the Dark Ones have tightened the grip and are fighting to stay in control. That is why the Dark Ones are fighting for another reset at that time. Hmm, can you explain exactly what you mean by a reset? asked Asteria. There have been many resets throughout Earth's history, said Dul Kara. A reset is when the Dark Ones annihilate humanity and start a new civilization 
with a new paradigm of mind control. Humans fall for mind control all the time because they have short memories, said Imra. Yes, agreed Alta. Humans lurch from one chaotic situation to the next, orchestrated by the dark ones. The humans do not learn because they have short lives. There have been six resets so far on Gaia, not least of all the repercussions of the destruction of Timat and the lunar arrival. Even the consequences of World War I and World War II in Earth's future, said Maxim, is too far back for modern 21st century humans to remember. Alternatively, of course, there is no one still alive who is willing to talk about their experiences. After several generations, humanity is unaware of what really happened and the consequences and of how people felt. Humans are persuaded to go out and beat their enemy, said Dulkara. They have sometimes fought each other over a 100 metre territory, bombing each other mindlessly. After two world wars, there was the war with Argentina and the Vietnam, Korean and Afghanistan wars. The next generations forget that it is all mind control and that the Dark Ones control both sides. And in Earth's 21st century, said Imra, the Dark Ones have the next civilization already mapped out. The focus for Earth in the decade from 2020 to 2030 is to annihilate most of the human population and the next step is transhumanism and AI. The Dark Ones already have satellite cities and communities operating with their new agenda. As we have already mentioned, they cannot create the environment that sustains themselves. They can only create with mind control so that they can feed off the fear of humanity. And remember, said Maxim, the Dark Ones are spawned out of our mind. We have created them from our own fear. How can you make that wrong? Remember, you don't fight your egregores, you integrate them, because darkness is the part of us that we do not accept within ourselves. All starseeds, however, said Irama, want to create a dominant high-frequency timeline from 2012 and that is why we are here. This is what is understood as the harmonic convergence. That is correct, said Ariana. Starseeds have been incarnating onto third density Earth for 12,500 years, ever since the lunar matrix, so that they can raise the collective consciousness. The starseeds came onto the earth to shed love and integrate fear because they can only change a system when they are actually inside the third density matrix. It was an assignment to come here to mentor and be in service for the new fifth density earth. Since 2012, there are also new starseeds incarnating onto earth who have a different DNA, said Irama, and they will be the new civilization for the new fifth density Earth. They have a totally different matrix in their DNA so that they are a frequency match for the new fifth density Earth and the new paradigm. And is that why the ETs are coming? asked Cinderella to mentor the new civilizations of starseeds. Yes, smiled Sarah. Oh, this is so exciting, exclaimed Shamara. 
If there was a tourism campaign in the universe, said Altar, it would be to come to Earth because a species is ascending. When we ascend to fifth density and beyond, it is likely that third density will never exist again. And to that end, said Maxim, bringing everyone's attention back to the present, we are going to travel to Stonehenge. Stonehenge? exclaimed Cinderella. Oh, I have heard so much about Stonehenge and have always wanted to go there. Maxim smiled fondly at Cinderella. In Stonehenge, we can set up a frequency with the druids who are already there, he said, and strengthen the energies of the harmonic convergence that is occurring in 2012. In this way, we can support humanity's ascension. This is the purpose of this journey. Minerva and Asteria hugged each other tightly and <laughs> laughing in excitement. They bounced up and down together. But first, said Maxim, I suggest that we travel through France. We need to trace Arsinoe's footsteps and complete her journey if we are to pick up the frequencies that she began. I feel a strong pull to visit the Aude Valley. This is the region in the south of France where Arsinoe spent her time in exile. It was there that she waited for the appropriate time to venture through France to the English Channel as she intended to journey to England. Maxim looked everyone in the eye, one after the other. Are we all in agreement? Yes, Maxim, yes, we all chimed in unison. <laughs> and so, my journey continues.